so as Emre said, so I come from Cancer Research UK, so I'm a little bit out of the sphere. Um, but today I'm going to talk about CRISPR. That's what my lab really specialises in. And the reason sort of I'm here today is because this is a technology that's really breaking down traditional barriers between disciplines. So really, this, this is all I'm going to talk about today, this slide. Uh, the molecule of DNA, uh, it's the one thing that unites every living thing that we know about in the universe. Uh, every living creature or organism, what have you, uh, in the knowable universe is united by DNA as a storage system. Uh, and on that DNA, it encodes all of the different attributes that make us human, uh, that make me me, that make you you, and make us different from each other. Um, coding all sorts of interesting attributes such as height through to intellect um, and beyond. So the story started long before this, but in 1953, for our purposes, it really started here with Watson and Crick uh, when they uncovered the structure of DNA. And that really just gave us some sort of insight into DNA and really led us to understand that DNA was a storage medium that connects all living things on the planet and gave us insights into how it's copied. DNA is often called the code of life. Every cell in your body contains DNA, or almost every cell. Uh, and that DNA is an identical copy from one cell to the other. Uh, in, in some sort of way, we're all just bags of little bags of cells, uh, all full of DNA. There's 37 trillion cells in the average human body and about 3 billion letters in every cell of DNA. If you're to add those up and if we're to look in more detail at these numbers, the 37 trillion cells in the body, I mean that, that, that number doesn't really, really mean much to anybody, but if I was to tell you that's 800 billion more than the number of galaxies in the observable universe, then you, you get a sort of a bit of a handle on the complexity of the human being. And if I was to tell you that there are three billion letters within each cell, if you were to pull them out and tease them apart, they'd be about two meters in length. And so if you were to take the DNA from an entire individual and pull that out, it would go from here to the center of town, out past Pluto. So that's just one individual. And so that's the amount of information you have stored in your body right now. But of course, it's not stored. It's, it's not a static thing. It's not a static chemical. It's constantly remolding, rebuilding, what have you, copying itself. Uh, and so every time one of your cells dies and gets replaced, uh, every time you start to grow or what have you, or shed off some more skin, uh, that DNA is being copied. So to put that into some sort of context, in the last minute you've made, every single one of you has made 300 million new red blood cells. That's shooting around your body, carrying oxygen from your lungs to your tissues, hopefully to your brain. Uh, there's 12 million new gut cells digesting your lunch, uh, and 40,000 new skin cells adding to the dust in the room. So all of that together makes one exabit worth of code that you've all just produced unknowingly in the last minute. So that's just to really put it into context that DNA, it can be vast, it can be complex, uh, and it can be rapidly remolding. So I'm just going to take a step back and, and look at the field of molecular biology and how we've interacted with DNA over the, over the well, recent and more distant past, and then I'll come around to CRISPR after that. So DNA, really the focus on DNA over the last 50 years has been on primarily on being able to read it. And so we read it through sequencing, sequencing of DNA. I'll talk, talk to you about that in a moment. And so what this, what this does, what this little pictograph shows you is sort of the history of us being able to grapple with and, and read DNA. So back in 1953, our story really begins, like I said before, with Watson and Crick. And through a, a series of Nobel-worthy discoveries, right up until about 1986, we developed the technology to be able to read DNA, but we still hadn't read a human's DNA. And so that began the big endeavor of the Human Genome Project, which lasted 15 years. And that was really a, a flat-footed race between a private firm and public, uh, well, and, and academia. At the end of that, we ended up with 
our first complete picture of what the DNA in a human looks like. And then just three years after that, all the technology that was used to create and, and derive that human genome was superseded by next generation sequencing. And I'm just going to put that into some sort of context here. The Human Genome Project um, was a massive global effort involving hundreds and hundreds of laboratories throughout the world. Uh, it cost 2.7 billion on average, well, as an estimate, and took 15 years. Now, if we're to look today at the latest sequences, this one here, for example, which we have about six of in our institute. To sequence a human genome, it takes, well, actually, it doesn't take one machine. It takes one small lane in the machine. It costs $1,000, and it takes about 72 hours. It actually takes, can take a lot less than that. So really what I want you to appreciate from this, this is null news. This is just to uh, allow you to appreciate how the ability to read DNA has gone from something sort of archaic in an exponential fashion to something that is fast and cheap and affordable and scalable. Writing DNA is something that is a field that's sort of come along a little bit slower. And so to be able to write DNA, what that really means is to take a bunch of chemicals, put them together in a test tube and construct DNA one base at a time. And so this only just really started setting off in the 80s, so 30 years after attempting trying to read DNA. Uh, but within the last probably three to five years, a series of startups and, and, and industry sort of focus has, has occurred in this area specifically for reasons which I'll go into very soon. And what we're seeing now is a massive increase in the rate at which DNA can be synthesized and a, and a concomitant re reduction in the cost of synthesizing DNA. So one of the main drivers for this is the obvious utility of DNA as just a data storage medium. And the reason for this is the highest density large-scale data storage medium that humans know about. You can theoretically put 215 petabytes of information into just one gram. So it's also the most stable data storage medium known to mankind. Uh, at the moment, this is our most robust and reliable storage medium. It's magnetic tapes, and we rewrite those every 15 to 20 years. But if you go into the Houses of Parliament and look what they store their information on, they store them on parchment because that lasts a lot longer. That lasts for hundreds of years. So this is a picture of the Magna Carta. However, DNA, we're extracting DNA from ancient fossils, from the permafrost, from woolly mammoths, what, you know. Uh, and so what we've got here is we've got something that can withstand thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of years. So we've got this high density data storage platform, which is incredibly robust uh, and incredibly versatile. So already uh, scientists have encoded the whole of w war and peace into DNA, uh, the entire contents of the seed vault, uh, and Microsoft uh, just recently encoded OKGO's okay music video in, in, into DNA. Uh, so, I mean, there's definitely a keen interest from companies such as Microsoft uh, to at least store some of their cloud storage information into DNA, and that's a proactive area they're looking at. Um, but from our purposes, this is all sort of old news. This is uh, in vitro. We call this in vitro. Uh, this is uh, non-living systems. So what I'm going to really talk to you today about is taking all of these advances and using the technology known as CRISPR, we're, going, we're starting to do these in vivo, so in living creatures, living organisms. So it's a massive paradigm shift. So what I'm going to talk to you about briefly today is the genome editing revolution, explain a little bit about what CRISPR is and how it works, and then talk to what the future holds. So this is a graph of just Google search terms of CRISPR over the last decade, and all I want you to appreciate for this is that it's increasing. Uh, something, some event happened in 2013, which we'll go into in the next slide, uh, and that set this skyrocketing. Uh, you could see that at 2013, CRISPR was really uh, the domain of Cambridge here and Cambridge over the pond. Um, but by 2017, the distribution has really gone throughout the Western world. 
although New Zealand seems to be missed out, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> and if we're to give some sort of comparison by some sort of ter search term that we're all familiar with, you can see that CRISPR is eclipsing even the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> so I mentioned 2013. Uh, so in 2013, I don't want you to really read and understand these scientific articles, but three publications came out that just really changed the way uh, and started a field, and that was these three here. And all they, all they did is they took a bacterial immune system and they used it as like a rewriting tool to rewrite the DNA in a mouse and also in human cells. Just four years later, which in biological research is a heartbeat, <laughs> uh, all of a sudden humans, well, human embryos, fish, crops, woolly mammoths, etc., have all been had their DNA rewritten. I've highlighted some of these things, human embryos, woolly mammoths, and dinosaurs. I'll come back and talk about human embryos later on. Uh, but signed, this is the first time we've been able to design or develop or, or maybe exploit a technology that is completely agnostic to species that can cross all the species' borders. Um, so people are using it, like I said, in agriculture to rewrite the DNA of animals or crops and what have you. Um, but also we can look at it in human embryo editing for maybe the eradication of disease or creation of designer babies. Uh, there's a, a lab in the US who has coined the term de-extinction, uh, and they're trying to bring back the woolly mammoth. Um, so they're fusing uh, woolly mammoth DNA from the permafrost uh, with elephant DNA. Uh, and also dinosaur I've got there. So in some sort of scene reminiscent of Jurassic Park, people are fusing well, predicted dinosaur DNA with chicken DNA to try and recapitulate Jurassic Park. So. I think a good barometer of uh, a disruptive technology is how it hits the headlines. Uh, and generally in science, this is a long, slow lag between basic discovery and some sort of, well, at least in my field, clinical impact. Usually it's a lag of about a couple of decades. <coughs> But what we've got here is a lag of two years. And this has never before really been seen, certainly in my time. And so here's, here's an impact, a directly relevant impact, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, there's talk of CRISPR being heralding a new wave of treatments in the clinic. Uh, a couple of studies came out last year. And these are interesting. These are done in animals. Uh, animal models of muscular dystrophy. Uh, one of the things I said about CRISPR is it's agnostic to whether you're a mouse or a man. So in many respects, any therapeutic that you make towards a mouse will work in a man. And so what they've done here, they've done two studies, one where they've taken a mouse with muscular dystrophy, injected the editing reagents into the muscles, and cured that. That's in the body of the mouse. That's not in the germ cells that'll be passed on. But another group edited the germ cells. So what they've done there is eradicated it from the baby mice that would be born and every mouse for the daughter, the granddaughters, et cetera. So they've eradicated disease from that entire line. That has huge, obvious um, ramifications for human disease. Uh, and then at the end of 2016, uh, CRISPR gene editing was tested in, in people. Since then, there's at least 25 clinical trials going on with CRISPR editing in people. This is an unprecedented pace we've never seen before. And I mentioned human embryos being edited. And so these have also, over the last, well, twice this year and once in 2015, been edited. So this is something really want to, want, what I want to get across here is it's gone from a basic science discovery straight to something that affects everybody in this room within the period of just a couple of years. Just to look a little bit closer at this, this case here. So this is young Layla Richards, and she presented at Great Ormond Street, Street Hospital down in London. Uh, she is diagnosed with a blood cancer at three months of age. And so she was given the standard point of care, which is a chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant. However, that failed. After that, there are no therapeutic options, so she's before her first birthday, so at 11 months of age, she was sent home, uh, and her parents told her to make her comfortable. She was not going to live to see her first birthday. So under some compassionate grounds, um, and through some sort of serendipity, um, some, some research which just predecessed, well, assisted technology to CRISPR, 
um, was used to treat her. And so what they did here was they took just some healthy immune cells from an American donor, just an American male donor, and these are T cells. So their, their job is to go out and seek and destroy viruses in our immune, they're part of our immune system that goes out and seeks and destroys viruses. So three changes were made with the CRISPR-like technology. The first was so that instead of going out and seeking and destroying virus, they would go seek out and destroy her cancer cells. The second was to make them immune to the therapy that they would also treat her with at the same time so that you're not killing the cure. And the third was to make them self-limiting so that once they've gone and done their business, there's no trace of the cure. So one and a half years later, there's no detectable leukemia in this girl. So this is someone on a death sentence that hasn't gone into remission. They haven't got slightly less cancer or what have you. They've got no detectable cancer. So this, is, this would classify as a cure. And that's something we don't often see in medicine. So clearly that's why Cancer Research UK is interested in this. Uh, and as, as, long as, as well as many other healthcare funders. So what is CRISPR? Uh, it's a battle as old as time right under our noses, literally. It's a battle between viruses and bacteria. So much like we catch cold through viruses, bacteria catch cold through viruses. They're infected by viruses all the time. Here's a picture of a brown bacterium, and it's being riddled with viruses. Uh, and the viruses are parasites. What they do is they bind to the surface, then they squirt in their own DNA. I hope you can maybe pick that out there as that bluey green strand into the bacteria. Why do they do this? Well, I've got this very complex uh, cartoon here. <laughs> it took me days to do. So if you can imagine this is a bacteria, and this is its bacterial DNA, and the virus is binding to it and squirting in its own DNA, which is conveniently a different color. Uh, what the virus is doing is it's using the bacteria as a machinery tool to generate more copies of its DNA and more copies of its coat to produce more of itself it then pops the cell and away it goes. Now it's a battle, occasionally the cell wins. And what it does is it records some of the information from that virus. It tucks it away neatly into a certain part of its genome for later. That's what CRISPR stands for, I'm not gonna read it out. It's sort of irrelevant to what CRISPR is really used for now, but over time what happens after more and more challenges with more and more viruses is you end up with an array of this information that's been coded. And so if you become challenged with the same virus again in the future, with the same color DNA, uh, you have a two-part system <laughs> which will search and destroy. It will search for a perfect match. It will cut it and destroy it. So that limits the infection. Uh, you could think of the array down here as some sort of sequence-specific GPS locator uh, and the other enzymes as a pair of scissors. What's really neat about this is as soon as that bacteria copies itself and divides and forms daughters, it passes on all of this immunity to them. So it's really an arms race between the viruses and the bacteria. So I'm not expecting you to understand this, but all I want to show you is a more scientific view of it, less Pac-Man, a bit more science. Uh, and so what we have here, this is the DNA across here. This is essentially the sat-nav component, the variable bit, which is completely programmable to any part of the genome. Uh, and this big blob around here is the enzyme, which is the scissors. Uh, and what's unique about this technology is this is cheap and easy to make. And so our sat-nav is very easy to code and recode. But this all in all makes the system precise, fast, cheap, and allows us to do lots of rewriting simultaneously and is incredibly customizable. So how are we exploiting CRISPR at the moment? In healthcare, just like I've mentioned with Leila Richards, uh, in agriculture. This is a picture of a double-muscled cow. Uh, it doesn't look pretty. Uh, <laughs> if you're the farmer, you get twice as much money for your meat. Uh, but this is a naturally occurring mutation that just has happened just through chance in one particular gene, uh, one particular series of letters, really. So scientists can, with CRISPR, you can recapitulate this at will in any organism you want. So what you're recreating here is a naturally occurring mutation at will. So it's not like a GM crop or a GM animal. You're actually just recreating nature, but with more precision. 
Uh, living data storage, which I'll get to on the last two slides. Synthetic biology, which I think you're going to hear more about from Jim. Uh, and augmented humanity. What I focus on in my job is taking disease DNA and making it normal. Augmented humanity is taking normal DNA and making it superhuman. So I just want to explain this little experiment that was done in, uh, in Harvard uh, just within the last six months. Uh, what this is is encoding for the first time information into a living biological system and then reading that out afterwards. So if I talk you through it, they started with a picture of a hand, then used some encoding software uh, to convert that into DNA. The DNA was then synthesized and then put into a bacteria. And it was put in, in an array-like form, just like I showed you in the previous slides. Then those bacteria, anything can happen to them. You can chuck them in the freezer and keep them for later. You can allow them to grow, expand at will. And when you're ready, uh, you can recall that information just by using that DNA reading, that sequencing technology, which is fast and cheap that we already do, and see what you get at the end with a decoding, the reverse algorithm to the start. And so this is the first experiment they did. Picture of a hand. This is the original image. Excuse the resolution. <laughs> Uh, and here is a reconstituted image after uh, the DNA had been growing in bacteria uh, for weeks. They weren't terribly happy with this. They didn't, want to, they didn't think it was that ambitious. They didn't want to just stop there. And so they decided to see if they could encode a little GIF, a little movie. Uh, one of the first stop motion animations from 1870, just five simple frames. And this is how they got on. I mean. It's not bad for a first go. There's about 90% uh, of the information is captured. Um, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, I think, from a first go. This is a world first, encoding this into living actual cells. But there's a very small step from here to <laughs> encoding every photo, movie, CD collection, etc., and then embedding it not just in E. coli, but in any cell in your skin. So this is some sort of deterministic approach where you decide what you want to put, what information you want to put into a, a bacteria. What if you could have some sort of autonomous recording going on where the cell or the bacteria or what have you is capturing information or predetermined information and storing that to be read out in a similar way? So this work has already been started and there's a, there's a large push in the field towards that. Uh, and here's just an example of it. It's a really burgeoning and developing area. But it may lead, it's not entirely clear what this could lead to, but this could lead to living sensors that could record what's happening inside a cell or an organism or, or within an environment. You could think of it as the Internet of Things version 2, a biological version. Um, but this, I mean, I really want to put this up here because last time I gave a similar talk, this was a pie-in-the-sky idea, but now this is a reality, and that such is the speed at which the field is moving. So where's the future taking us? Hopefully within six months I won't be talking about all of these things, so uh, we'll see. Uh, but realistically, I mean, the eradication of disease is being touted as one of the, one of the things that CRISPR might bring. Same with uh, augmented humanity, designer babies, novel threats. I mean, we're starting to discuss and tackle these issues because designer babies, for example, is a very real possibility given that we're editing the germline now. Uh, novel threats, that has not been addressed at all. Augmented humanity, there is a strong interest in this um, from governments and from scientific <coughs> research institutes. And eradication of disease, this is obviously where the, the bulk of the emphasis is at the moment. And that's the end, and that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.